I'd like you to look this morning at um, maybe a, just to begin with, to look at what Charles read. I want you to turn to Ezekiel. If you turn right in the middle of your Bible, you'll probably be in the poetic books, Psalms, Proverbs. Go to your right and you'll hit Isaiah, the first big boy. And then Jeremiah, who hits in the second position. And then the third guy is Ezekiel. Then Hosea, the great Hispanic prophet who comes in. Then Daniel. And so you'll find Ezekiel chapter 28. I'll tell you why we're looking at this. Uh, in Revelation 12, Charles read you a text about the casting out of Satan from heaven. And that event is really a culmination of all of the preceding Bible. It is uh, looking to the termination in chapter 20 of all the preceding Bible. But it's the end of a story. Revelation is the revelation of Christ and it's the revelation of Satan as to who he is. And it's the end of a story that doesn't begin in Revelation. It began before the book of Genesis in the very mind of God. It's, it's interesting, but our world looks at the need of good and the bad of evil. Would you agree? Nobody likes evil. Everybody loves good. We want to install good, get rid of evil. But those are the, uh, that's the fruit that's not the root. In, in our society, you can never, ever be allowed to speak of the origin of all good, and that is the Trinitarian God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you can't speak about that. In Congress, you can talk about the good that we need to institute, but you cannot mention that name of Yahweh. That's forbidden. And you can't mention the solution in Jesus Christ. That's why we love to sing Christmas hymns. They're folk songs about the solution. And you, can't talk of, you can talk about evil, but you can't talk about the root. You can't mention the name Satan any more than you can mention Christ. And so our world looks at the second dimension. It doesn't go back to the backdrop, the roots of evil. If you were going to write a novel on the Bible, you could call it The Prince and the Angel. And those are two things you cannot speak about. Christ and Satan, they're forbidden words. But that's what the Bible looks at, is this collision. You've got to be a Christian to have the, the glasses to be able to see it. And so I'm going to show you this morning, I thought we were going to do it this morning, but we're going to do it this morning and next week. And you might be saying, boy, on Christmas? Yes, on Christmas. The best message you can preach before Christmas is Satan in hell. That's right. Because whenever we sing, God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power. Why? Yeah. The being behind the curtain, Satan's power. So let me give you two weeks of the devil. All right? I've always wanted to do this. You do this when you've been pastoring 41 years and you can't get fired, but you always want to do this. <laughs> there's, there's lucky number 13 points. There's 13 points. Let me give you about seven this Sunday. And then after, before next Sunday, do not die. All right. Number one, you would begin in what is called the decree of God. The mind of God. Shakespeare saw the Capulets and the Montagues quarrel. And he thought through the story that it would end with uh, Romeo and Juliet dead in a tomb. Bringing reconciliation to warring families. That was in his mind. But when you pick up Romeo and Juliet, you don't see it all at first. It progresses through conflict. And so it's one story, but it unfolds in pages. The Bible is all in the mind of God. It's his decree of all that shall occur, good and evil, all that he shall cause, all that he shall permit, all that shall glorify ultimately himself, but it's in his mind. You get to see it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Where? Leviticus. 
numbers. Do you get to look at it page by page? The decree of God is a plan by God to set forth himself and to glorify himself. The word glorify is from the Greek word doxa, D-O-X-A, which means an opinion. Doxazo means that you elevate the opinion of somebody by what you say about them. Whenever I'm introduced to speak, they always ask me, what do you want me to say? And boy, can I write up a resume. One of the great athletes of the 20th century, possibly the most handsome individual in the late half of the 20th century. I'll give him all this. Because they want you to know when I'm introducing this guy, he's not just some galoot. Okay. He's done something. Well, the Bible raises your opinion as you keep reading. You go, great is God of the Christian. And so it glorifies him. And it is not just to glorify him to a creation. It is to share himself with a creation. Little images of him with intellect like him. Emotions like him and wills like him. First, you saw beings like him that were called sons. Angels are called sons of the mighty. Human beings are called, uh, in a sense, sons of God. Uh, They are all his offspring, said the Apostle Paul. And so it began with uh, beings like him who would relate to him, men and angels. And then there will occur in God's mind the entrance of sin. Sin both in the angelic realm and sin that will be commuted to the human realm. In other words, sin is not an eternal yang to the yin, so to speak. It is an origin. It has an origin in the angelic realm. It has an origin in men. It is an absolute evil in contrast to an absolute God. And so he will share himself with this creation that will be created as sons and then there will be a flaw. There will be a time and space rebellion both in angels and in men. And then you will see the solution. And in so so doing, the solution to evil is going to be so mysterious, so mighty, so awesome, so horrific that the initial believers in it will not understand it. They will oppose it. I am going up and on the third day you will die and I will rise again. Peter, this will never happen to you. Even they couldn't understand it. Are you with me so far? There is a plan in the mind of God. Christ was crucified, it says, before the foundation of the world. It's in his mind. And then you saw the angelic creation. And you saw a place Heaven is not an eternal place. Matter is not eternal. It is a corporeal place that was created, not for God, but for God to share with these creatures. It is called in the Bible the holy mountain. It is called the holy city. It is called our Father who art in heaven. It is the full manifestation of God's beauty, of God's power, of God's wisdom, and of God's glory. And then he created to be occupied in it, a myriad, it is called, of servants. They are called angelos, means messenger. It's the root word of evangelism, a good message. They are angelos, they're messengers. Messengers to who? That's soon to be shown. And they are servants of God. And there is one particular one who is a particular mighty, particular wise, exalted, and beautiful servant. He is called the covering cherub, unquote. Just as on the Ark of the Covenant, you had two cherubs that covered the presence of God. He is a covering cherub. He's an honor guard, the one most trusted, the one whose beauty can only be explained in precious stones. He's in Ezekiel 28. That's why I had you turn there. There are two scriptures in the Bible that show the pre-fall of this person. He has a name that comes from the name in Isaiah, Son of Dawn, Star of the Morning. What is the word for light in Spanish? 
Luz, the planet Venus, the brightest in the heavens in the morning, was called Lucifer. And so Satan is not called Lucifer, but it is derived from this term of the bright, shining one. In chapter 28 of Ezekiel, the author laments the fall of the king of Tyre, of Sidon, of Phoenicia. They became so wealthy with international Mediterranean trade that their, their heart was lifted up. And behind that king, uh, Ezekiel, God inspiring him, shows who's behind him. Do you remember last week we looked at the dragon of Satan? And coming from him were seven heads that were seven kingdoms. There were seven empires emitting from him. They were all evil, but behind them all was the devil. You don't know that until you read the book. And so behind this king of Phoenicia, you see that there's someone animating him, the God of this world. He says to the king of Tyre and the one behind him, you have the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You ever read Revelation 22 at what the heavenly city looks like? It is a garden of God of which Eden was a mere shadow and a counterpart. The word Eden in Hebrew means delight. At his right hand are pleasures forever. And so here is delight. And you had, uh, were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. Ruby, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, lapis lazuli. Do you all know what that is? I don't either. Well, let's just keep on going. The turquoise, the emerald, gold, the workmanship of settings and sockets was in you. That is the highest compliment, that there are no terms for your beauty except the precious stones. Incidentally, where else in the Bible do you see something depicted with precious stones as its foundation? The New Jerusalem. It is glorious. And it was in you. I take it that this angel was one that the brilliance of God went from him and illumined all about. Well, that was in you from the day you were created. There was a time he was not and a time he was. You were the anointed cherub who covers and I placed you there. Meaning you are because I called you into being. You are beautiful because I called you into being. And you were where you were because I called you into being. Who should be the highest in worship of all of heaven? Lucifer, because he was given the most. And you walked, you were on the holy mountain of God and you walked in the midst of the stones of fire. God said on Sinai, don't you come near to the burning mountain. This angel walked among the, co the coals of fire and gave forth splendor. You are blameless in your ways. From the day you were created, second time, until unrighteousness was found in you. There was a period, I gather, of probation of the angelic realm, a test of that realm. After the fall of Lucifer, no other angels can fall. They are simply called the elect angels. And what became the demons are in total depravity and they cannot return. So no more will ever fall. None will come back. It is fixed. And so in 15 or 16, it was because of the abundance of your trade. You were so powerful and so mighty. Can blessedness ever corrupt us? Yeah. You were internally filled with violence and then it came out, you sinned, and I cast you as profane from the mountain of God. I destroyed you, covering cherub, midst, from the midst of the stones of fire, because your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor, and I cast you to the ground. Go to your left to Isaiah 14, and you'll see very specifically the reason. Go past Jeremiah on to Isaiah, and in chapter 14, he talks about the fall of the king of Babylon, but you see somebody behind it that can only be the devil. 
You see in chapter 14 and verse 12, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, O son of dawn, Lucifer, the bright one. You who have, we have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations, you said in your heart, see if you can spot the term used five times, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the angelic realm, the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. What word have you seen so far? I will, it's the essence of sin. My will be done. And finally, I will make myself like El Elyon. I will be supreme. Milton wrote he would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. Milton wrote in Paradise Lost that Lucifer said, Evil shall be my good. And so he was cast out. Well, that is called the fall of the angelic realm. And apparently there are those that are called his angels. He is cast into the lake of fire along with his angels that were the demonic realm. Their corruption was total. Their corruption was final. They cannot, nor will they repent, nor will it be offered to them. For there is nothing essentially you can show them of God. They have it turned away. God's worthiness and God's glory had now been challenged. There now would be a demonstration to the angelic realm of the glory of God. And there would be a termination of all that raises his head against God. But it would not be done in an impetuous manner. It would be done in a book this thick from the beginning to the end to show the majesty and the wisdom of God. A demonstration that is so enigmatic and so mysterious that the Bible says the angels long to look. Paul put it like this. This was in accordance with God's eternal purpose, which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in order that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the angelic realm. This is the eternal purpose for God to show himself. Satan's evil is going to bring a greater good. Well, that's number one. And number two, you have seen the decree of God, the angelic creation, and you have seen the rebellion. One, two, and three. Are you with me so far? Merry Christmas and a happy new year. That's a great message before Christmas. Number four, now you see God create the palette and the canvas upon which this place or this mystery will take place. It is called the known universe. That's the setting. That's the stage. And then we're going to have one blue orb that is called Earth. And that is going to become the limelight. And then we shall have the actors. And those are called humans, angels, and demons. The creation of man and the universe. You have man that is the very opposite of the angelic realm. He is small and he is weak. When I consider the heavens and the works of thy hands, what is man that thou art concerned with him? Nor the son of man that thou dost take note of him. But you've made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. God will make himself known in majesty not through the angelic realm. When you see an angel, you go, of course, he's the mightiest thing in the universe. A little bitty baby human? How long is a human, an animal that is born with immediate ability to act is called precocious. How long does it take a human before he can keep from being eaten? I would say at first about 15 years. Now I'd say 50 to 60 years until he will not kill himself by stupidity. We're the weakest and the stupidest of all the creatures, and God will show his greatness. And I think it irritated somebody that they have to be an angelos to these bunch of 
The Hebrews is a bozos, okay? <laughs> but they have to care for these people. That's a lie. All right. And these people are going to receive the creation mandate. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with the glory of God. And to seal your immortality, I've put you a tree, a tree of life. Eat of it and live forever. It's a gift. And every movement in the Bible of history is always given a test that the angelic realm beholds. This is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what that means is that you will not know good and evil by the life of God. You and I know good and evil through the life of God. You eat of this tree and you'll be God. And you won't need him anymore. You will be an existentialist. You will create and discern good and evil from yourself. Dr. Phil right here would speak and say, and that's doing well. You're going to determine good and evil. In other words, this is a tree of faith and rest. This is a tree of pride and self-assertion. If you eat of this tree, you get your motor running way out on the highway looking for adventure. And like a true nature's child, you are born to be wild. Don't take it. Take, believe my word. Don't take it. Test. Here came the temptation. Will Satan obey God or will he obey Satan? The choice is called the fall. Normally when we talk about a person rejecting God and going out on their own, it is called the rise. God calls it the fall. The tempter was called the serpent. Who is it? Revelation 12, 9. The dragon that is called the serpent of old. The devil and Satan. He lied. He lied about God's word. He lied about God's character. And he lied about God's justice. Has God said you shall not eat any tree in the garden? Yes, Eve said. You shall not eat of any tree or touch it lest you die. You shall not surely die. I beg your pardon? That is a lie. God's word is not true. And I'll tell you why it's not true. Because the man that gave it is not good. He does not want you to become like him where he won't need you anymore. That's why he keeps you under his finger. God is for the fools and the weak. You need to fly, little butterfly. And I'll tell you another thing. You will not surely die. The notion that the rejection of God's word, the rejection of God's character, it is not going to be met with death. It is going to be met with life. I, the serpent, I'm the fan of man. Reject God, reject his word, reject your, what you've heard. Assert yourself and fly. Y'all ever heard that? Assert yourself and fly. The worst thing ever happened to you was God. And you know what happened. Uh, they took, they ate, and they died. And it began what you would call Satan's kingdom. Now man had been commandeered. He became a son of disobedience, a child of the devil. He became a son of wrath under the domain of darkness, the dominion of sin, and under the prince of the power of the air, held captive by him to do his will. Man was commandeered and mankind now belonged to Satan. The Apostle John said by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. And man is now conceived in sin and brought forth in iniquity. Something is wrong from his very nature. He is helpless and he is hopeless. He is so dead that he thinks he's alive. And the farther he gets from God, the more alive he feels. And he thinks that the most horrible thing in the world would be to return to the author of his life. He is not just helpless, but he's part of the enemy. Number five, after the creation of man in the universe, Satan's doom is immediately promised. The Bible will not let you in any way mistake what the solution to evil is. 
It will not let you think that the problem with man is merely his psychology or his health or his political setup or his thinking. It lets you know it is the devil and it is the alienation from God. The Bible is not elusive on that idea. It, does, it is not mystic on that idea. It is very straight. You've heard me say it before. When you are an astronaut on a spacewalk, the most important part of your gear is your tether. Because if you get cut loose from the mothership, you are sucked into the black darkness and you are gone. The most important thing about man is God. When Adam is created, before he sees the universe, his wife, kids, anything, he sees God. And in light of God, everything else is well defined. Once you lose sight of God, everything now becomes fuzzy and then bizarre. And so, Satan's doom is now promised. There is no misinformation as to where the solution will come from. It will not come from reincarnation. Do y'all want to start all over again? If there is a magic woofle dust that will raise you up and let you start over again, and somebody at my funeral comes to sprinkle it on me, you stop him. Do you want to go through junior high? Would you like to go through that again? No. It's not going to be reincarnation. It's not going to be good works. It's not going to be making a pilgrimage. It's not going to be trying harder. It's not going to be politics. It's not going to be education. It's not going to be science. It's not going to be medicine. Uh, you can't be Faustus and sell your soul to the devil. That's not going to work. What's going to be your solution is nothing that you do. You have to lay there totally silent and get a transfusion. God tells you, the seed of woman will crush the serpent's head. There's going to be a man come someday and he's going to bring victory over Satan. And the serpent will wound his heel. A man is going to bring victory on behalf of man over sin, Satan, and death. And that man, in so doing, is going to have to die. And so, man, you will just lay there like Yom Kippur and you will watch someone walk into the presence of God for you and walk out for you. You yourself will do nothing. And if you approach one inch, the offer is withdrawn. The seed of woman will crush the serpent's head. The serpent will wound his heel. Sin occurred in Genesis 3, 14. The proto-evangelion of where salvation comes from is Genesis 3, 15. It's the oldest religion known to man. It is called an anointed one dies for you. In the Old Testament, the word anointed would be the term Mashiach, Messiah. In the New Testament, we don't use the term Messiah. We use the word Christos. The oldest religion is Christianity. Well, uh, Satan intervened after Adam and Eve. The earth was filled with violence, corrupted in every way. Why? Because that mysterious passage I showed you a number of weeks ago where the sons of God left their own domain and saw that the daughters of women were beautiful and made them the offer of eternal life. Prior to the flood, the term gods is never used. Man is very aware of a tree, two trees, of a tree of life guarded by cherubim, of the presence of God in a garden having man come to him with sacrifice. Now he is aware of Cain being cast forth and of another civilization erupting. Now, man is very aware of God. The term gods is not mentioned until the sons of God come into the daughters of men and it produced such a humanity that God had to wipe it from the face of the earth. And then after the flood, we have a new beginning. It's like we have Eden all over again on a scarred earth. But at the Tower of Babel, we had a second fall. Man came together and say, we're gonna be scattered across the earth we better stick together, and here's what we'll do. We will build a city. We will build a tower, a ziggurat, like a mountain going upward and into the heavens, and we will call it the gate of God. Bob El, God said, I'm going to call it Babel, confusion. What you think is deity, I will call confusion. You know who the guy was that started it? Genesis 10, a guy named Nimrod. Never name your kid Nimrod. His name means let us rebel. Bad name. Well, he started it. 
God slowed down the evil process. He divided them. They became the nations. Now Satan no longer just had man. Now Satan had history. The nations will be mine. And do you know what? It's at this point in your Bible that chronologically the first term is used for God's. Joshua, in his day, spoke about Abraham that raised up in Genesis chapter 11 was Abraham. And he said that Abraham and his fathers worshipped gods. I think that after the flood, you know, you had that withdrawal of the beatific presence of God from the earth. You now had a God that you approached completely sightless by faith. And so man, to have something with sight on it, made God into a constellation, made him into the Egyptians a coyote, made him the Assyrians into a bull, made him the Greeks uh, into the moon and the sun, Apollo and Diana, that you made God into something that you could fathom. Uh, God said, or the Apostle Paul said, the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice not to gods, not to idols, but to demons. 1 Corinthians 10, 20. He said, they're not sacrificing to idols. There is no such thing as an idol. They're sacrificing to demons. I remember at seminary, Dr. Norm Geisler talking about the presence of demons. And some guy said to him, how do we know there's not a demon behind every bush? He said, there is. We continue. After the fall of man, now God raised up a light that even though that the nations went out in their idolatry and in their error, intermarrying within who they were that would occur in the races and the, and the religions, God right in the middle of man he put a nation about the size of New Jersey. And it was called Israel. And it was a miracle nation by a man that couldn't have a kid, who had a kid, who he hadn't yet had a kid, and gave birth to 12 boys. And they formed the 12 tribes of Israel, and through them God gave his word. God gave in that Bible answers to the great questions. God gave law as to right and wrong. God gave salvation and where it would come from, from the Messiah. And God gave you the future of what would happen if you did and didn't. It was the perfect book. The one book you cannot teach outside of the Bible in our day. And in many countries, will bring you your death. And so, did Satan and Israel collide? I think so. From the time that Moses came down the mountain, they collided. And he destroyed them from within. He didn't have to turn Israel against a correct defense or correct politics or correct social system. He cut Israel loose from the tether of God. And as a result, the family fell, morality fell, sexuality fell, right and wrong fell, the ethic of business fell, the ethic of the neighborhood and civility fell, and they consumed each other because they had no God. What did it all end up? The Assyrians destroyed them in 722. The Babylonians destroyed what was left in 586. Then the Persians destroyed them. And Israel, by the middle of the Old, but between the Old and New Testament, Israel is held in captivity by the Persians. And it's right at this time that a group of Israelites returns, 50,000 of them, rebuilds their temple. And they're just a little bitty suburb of heaven. Let me show you what Satan thought about them. Look to the very end of your Old Testament. The book of Zechariah, the next to last prophet of your Old Testament. When you find it, nudge the fellow next to you and say, I have found it. Look at Zechariah chapter 3 after about 1,300 years of Jewish history. And here we are. Let's see. Abraham was 2,000. 
This is about 400. What's 400 from 2000? 1600. So this is about 1600 years after Abraham. And in verse 1, he showed me Joshua the high priest. That's not Joshua, Moses, buddy. But it's a high priest that was alive, the representative of the Aaronic priesthood, still survived till this time. And he is standing in a vision before the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Messiah. Whenever he's referred to, he's referred to as God. Whoever looks at him says, I have seen God. He will not occur. Once the New Testament begins, as he is now an incarnation in the person of Jesus Christ. And so the high priest is standing before the angel of the Lord. And there is somebody at his right hand to slander him. Question, who is the person that is there at the end of the Old Testament? Satan. He's alive and well. And so in verse 2, as he, the word devil comes from the word to accuse Does Satan have some good uh, body of knowledge to accuse with? What evil would you like to use, Satan? What age would you like to pick? It's all there. Israel only had a couple of little spurts of Camelot. Any place you want to turn to, you can show perversion, murder, idolatry. And so Satan is just reaming him. Do you notice that Joshua the high priest never says a word? Not one word. How come? Because the Lord is in his holy temple. And let all the earth keep silent. He has shut up all in disobedience. In verse 2, here's the hope of Israel. The Lord said. You notice what he calls the angel of the Lord? The Lord said. He has a mediator. A person between him and God an advocate, a lawyer, and he speaks up. And he says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Meaning, shut up, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem's hope? God's grace. I chose you. You stand before me by nothing you have done, but because of my divine choice. Sound like somebody else? Sounds like us. You are what you are by my grace. And in verse 2, is this not a brand plucked from the burning fire? He said, Satan, they're worse than you think they are. He does not brag about Israel. They were the staff of the shepherd and it has been burned. And all that I have left is this little nub of 50,000. No, Satan, they have been burned. But I stand for them. And I argue for them. And in verse 3, what does Joshua look like? He's clothed in filthy garments. Because of Israel from the Mount Sinai onward, continually is in rebellion. And so he is filthy. You remember what Isaiah said? Our deeds of righteousness are like filthy rags. Just turn to the guy next to you and share the worst three things about you, would you? No, we don't have time. Whenever my son joined Homeland Security, they had a guy who gave him a, a seven-hour polygraph. And he was the greatest polygraph giver in the world. A strange-looking guy, glasses were taped together, big red pointed boots, and uh, looked like George McFly. You ever seen, uh, <laughs> what was that show? Back to the Future, look at George McFly. And he set my boy down, said, well, We're about to start. Uh, I want to ask you something. Have you ever murdered somebody? Because there's no chance to use limitations on murder. I'm going to ask you if you've murdered anybody. And if you say no, I'm going to know. And then we're going to bring in the law and we're going to take you to prison. So before I start this, have you murdered anybody? And Ben said, what do you mean murdered? Well, that's you before God. I know your heart. What you thought was secret sin on earth, it was 3D in heaven. It was high definition. 
and I have a memory that don't quit. I know what you did, and you're not going to argue your way against it. So would you like to say anything? Hmm. And so, verse 4, he spoke the angel and said to those who were standing, remove the filthy garments from him. Everybody say hallelujah. I'm going to take your filth from you. And I've taken your iniquity away, and now I'm going to clothe you. Everybody say hallelujah. I'm going to clothe you with literally, the Hebrew says, robes of rejoicing. You're just going to stand there. I'm going to take it away, and I'm going to impute it too. That sound like anybody you know? Sounds like you. I wash away your guilt, and I impute to you my righteousness. And then in verse 5, I'm going to put a turban on your head that says, uh, holy unto Yahweh, and you're going to begin your purpose again. So Israel, you stand by the grace of God. You notice that Satan has got nothing else to say. We're saved by grace. Israel as a nation nationally was saved by grace. But that's just to show you, does Satan know who the truth is in the Old Testament? Yes. Does he hate him? Yes. And he wants him dead. Well, that's our sixth point. The last point is called the coming of Jesus. 400 years later, here he comes in the midst of their hardest times. Greeks have trampled him. Romans have trampled him. Revelation 12, 4, the lady of light Israel gives birth to a child who is to rule the nations and Satan is waiting to destroy him. You know why? Do you remember when Jesus faced the man with the legion of demons? Y'all remember that? And the man came to meet Jesus and the demon spoke and the demon said, I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. I know your name. I know where you're from, and I've followed you for years. I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. And then he said, Holy One of God, Messiah. Satan saying, I know about you what these yokels don't. And then he said, Have you come to destroy us before the time? I know we've got a date with you and you're going to cast us into the lake of fire. Is it now? Or is there something to come? I know who you are. And Jesus said to him, shut up. I'm going to be announced by you. Shut up. And so Jesus went to the cross. And that's why Satan wanted him dead. Because Jesus was going to do the thing that Satan was most scared of. He was going to live a life of absolute divine perfection. And then he was going to die for the criminal. He was going to rise from the dead, vindicating that death. And then he was going to call to himself those of his sovereign pleasure. And he was going to give them a transfusion. They would just lay there. I'll take away their sin. I'll impart to them my glory. I'll put a new heart within them. And they're going to live. And I'm going to turn them loose. And they're going to touch others. And we're going to multiply. Satan was deathly scared of that. He's not scared of politicians. He's not scared of educators. He's not scared of scientists or doctors. He is scared of virgin-born God-men who die substitutes and rise holy because he's going to infect everybody else, and he did. And now what age are we in? And so he was cast out. He's not finished at the cross, but he's... It's like God has cut his tendons and he's lost his grip. And now God is able to take men out. And that's what he's doing. Let me show you one more thing. Look at Luke chapter 11. I showed you this. I want to show it to you again. Luke 11. Jesus was accused of doing his miracles by the power of the devil. He said, oh, no. He said in Luke eleven twenty. He said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God is on you. The kingdom has come. I'm the king. I'm the Messiah. And I'm among you. And no, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to act with Satan. I am his worst nightmare. When a strong man, that is Satan, fully armed, that is Satan, guards his own household. Who is called here Satan's household? Look around. It's us. He owned us. We were his chillins. 
It says his possessions are undisturbed. There was no way you and I were going to get out of hell. Can you go to hell with a doctoral degree? Probably quicker. <laughs> Can you go to hell rich? Probably quicker. Can you go to hell? Uh, you name it. His possessions are undisturbed. We can never reach the problem that is in our natures. And so you and I were helpless and we were hopeless. Verse 22. What's the first word in verse 22? But, that's a marvelous word, isn't it? But when someone stronger than he attacks. Question, who is the someone stronger than the devil? Jesus. What does it mean he attacks him? It means that Christ came on that first Christmas and he landed and it was Normandy and he got a beachhead. He rose from the dead and th Satan thought, oh dear, he's loose. And then in verse 22, he overpowers him and he takes from him all of his armor. I'm going to take away death. I'm going to take away blindness. I'm going to take away alienation. And I'm going to enable men to be found saved, righteous, raised from the dead, and able to, to navigate earth under the power of the kingdom of God. I am going to take your children from you. And at the end of verse 22, he distributes his plunder. Who's the plunder of Satan? Man. What does that mean? He distributes I'm going to take you from the domain of darkness and I'm going to put you into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light. Isn't that wonderful? Everybody say glory. Glory. That is wonderful. And in verse 23, he that's not with me is against me. He who doesn't gather with me scatters. Once you get saved, you are now enlisted and you are now a gatherer. Satan's job is to shut you up. I've got to either deceive you in error. I've got to distract you in wealth. I've got to disqualify you in sin. I've got to divide you by inability to get along with fellow Christians. Can that ever happen? And if possible, I would like to have you dead. And thus he goes forth in Revelation 12 to war with the woman of light Israel and all her children, the Gentiles. Next week, we'll finish. Do not die. Be here next week. Let's remember the Lord and the Lord's table. For just a few moments, God, we stop and we remember the death of Christ. You have told us whenever we gather, whenever we will, whenever we choose, that we have a feast as a family that we remember you, that this is my body for you. This is my blood for you. You didn't save yourself. I saved you. You experienced me. You took me inside of you. Not your family did this. You did this. Not the father did it for the kid, but the kid did this. Not the grandkid did it or grandpappy for grandkid but the grandkid did it not the wife through the husband but the wife did it you have no grandchildren only children and when we tasted the Lord and we found that he was good and we were brought into communion into fellowship we now had a new life within us and you said as often as you will don't you ever ever forget square one no matter how far you travel no matter how deep you learn, no matter how much Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek that you learn, no matter how many degrees that you pile on, don't you ever forget Ned in the first reader that you are saved by the grace of God. Amen.